welcome to the Residents to Preserve Public Housing Weekly Coalition meeting. I'm excited uh, to be here with you all like every other Sunday. Uh, for those of you who may not know, the Residents to Preserve Public Housing or RPPH is a citywide-led group of public housing resident leaders, including members of NYCHA Citywide Council of Presidents. We aim to preserve public housing by advocating for adequate funding, improving the quality of services and increasing resident decision-making authority. The Residents to Preserve Public Housing formed directly in response to NYCHA's Blueprint for Change proposal. So what is NYCHA's Blueprint for Change proposal? As we understand the proposal, first and foremost, we wanna make it clear that this proposal, the Blueprint for Change proposal is not rad. The Housing Authority has roughly 176,000 units. 62 of those, 52,000 of those units were approved under RAD or PAC. The blueprint aims to cover the remaining units, which is roughly 110,000 units. So it's important to understand the difference between these two programs. The second is that the blueprint is going to require state law to form what's known as the Public Housing Preservation Trust. In addition to creating a Public Housing Preservation Trust, the Housing Authority or the Public Housing Preservation Trust wants to apply for what's known as tenant protection vouchers to bring in additional funding uh, to these NYCHA units that need funding and need major repairs. It also will call for borrowing money from private investors. So what will happen, um, what we have learned in terms of how uh, the blueprint aims to generate additional funding is that the housing authority believes that they can bring in roughly about $6 from every dollar that they get from the tenant protection vouchers. However, it is still not clear and transparent exactly how much money the housing authority would be borrowing, when they're gonna be borrowing this money, and of course, when they're gonna pay this money back. And more importantly, it's not clear on what will happen if the housing authority or the Public Housing Preservation Trust is not able to pay back all of the monies that it borrowed. So, to be clear, the blueprint is a proposal. And these are the steps that Gregory Ross must go through in order to implement the blueprint for change proposal. So first they need to create law, state law to create the Public Housing Preservation Trust. As you know, the legislation was introduced twice and we, along with many residents and organizations across the city, were able to get the legislation put on pause again. In addition to needing legislative action, it also needs approval from HUD. And so what that means is that in order for HUD to approve it, this plan must be a part of NYCHA's five-year annual plan. If it is not a part of this five-year annual plan, they must introduce it as a significant amendment. We know because we recently testified at NYCHA's annual hearing that it was part of their five-year plan. We'll talk a little bit more about how that process was not um, accommodating to say the least. This plan also requires HUD to provide the tenant protection vouchers. In order for HUD to give out these tenant protection vouchers, HUD must conduct um, an inspection to classify each unit as obsolete. In this proposal, the Housing Authority is asking HUD to waive the inspection process. Their argument is that it is already clear that these units meet the criteria under obsolete and, in, and qualify for these tenant protection vouchers. So again, they wanna waive the inspection process. Finally, not finally, excuse me, in addition to HUD approval, it also needs congressional appropriations. What they are asking for is funding to cover 110,000 units. As it currently stands, that is not enough tenant protection vouchers 
uh, that would accommodate the Blueprint for Change plan. And so this plan calls on Congress to appropriate additional tenant protection vouchers. And then finally, ah, baby. this plan, finally, this plan is going to uh, require uh, private investors. So the public, housing, public, the public Housing Preservation Trust will need to secure loans from private lenders. So let me be very clear. The residents to preserve public housing say no to not just Blueprint for Change proposal. We are against the Blueprint for Change proposal, one, because it was developed without the input and approval of current NYCHA residents as stipulated by HUD 964 regulations. Second, the drastic changes proposed by the Blueprint for Change was introduced during COVID-19 pandemic when we can't safely communicate the facts, information, and details of this plan to NYCHA residents. Third, this trust will generate private debt using our homes and the tenant protection vouchers as collateral without any protection against foreclosure. And finally, which scares us the most, if this plan is approved, if the Blueprint for Change proposal is approved, and combined with the rental assistance demonstration, also known as PAC, there will be no more public housing in New York City. In other words, every single NYCHA apartment will be converted into a Section 8 apartment. So we'll have some time to go over this presentation. If you have any questions, we'll definitely have some time to go over it. Uh, but before we do, I am excited uh, to introduce to you all one of my favorite elected officials, uh, someone who has taken the time off today to be with, to be with us um, and discuss the future of public housing and how we can work um, in solidarity to do that. Uh, so without further ado, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm gonna ask you all to join me in welcoming uh, State Senator Robert Jackson. Good thank afternoon you. and welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Welcome. Uh, welcome. Can everybody please, I hate to interrupt. Sorry, Aisa, I, I, I did it though. I think I know you're just gonna ask everyone to mute. I asked everyone to mute and then I'm gonna give the floor to the Senator now. Well, first let me thank you for inviting me to come in. Uh, this is an important meeting for me uh, in that I get to hear directly from all of you, residents and leaders uh, of NYCHA citywide in order to try to determine the best course of action uh, in order to achieve the objectives uh, re regarding NYCHA, meaning maintaining and keeping clean and oper operating elevators and heating plants and rooftops and all of the things that anyone has to do when you own so many um, developments in the city of New York in order to keep it up to uh, operating standards of satisfaction uh, in regards to the law and the regulations and the satisfaction of the residents. And so uh, not growing up in NYCHA, uh, I don't know uh, the experiences that you have uh, by living in NYCHA. But I do have experiences visiting uh, friends and others and residents that I've represented, not only in the state Senate, but many of you know that I was a member of the city council from 2002 to 2013, which was 12 years. Uh, and as someone that was born and raised in New York City, uh, it, it wasn't the first time for me to go into NYCHA development uh, only when I got into the city council. So, but I say to you, I don't know all of the issues and concerns like you do. And so this is an opportunity for me to join for the first time, you know, I think it's a biweekly meeting uh, in order to listen and to learn. Uh, I've read uh, some documents. So for example, uh, Aaron Rose, who's on 
the Zoom with us. Uh, she is our policy director and Matthew Levy is our legislative director. And they've given me a document that I read regarding the difference between section eight and section nine housing uh, and the operating funds and the rental assistance, the RAD programs and all the other things that my staff, uh, especially from a policy and legislative point of view should know. Uh, also, Chris Nichols, uh, Chris is our deputy chief of staff uh, he was a uh, part of the group that on a continuous basis met regarding uh, the Chelsea Elliott houses because my district, if you don't know, goes from parts of Marble Hill where Marble Hill houses is located at. And not all of it, Marble Hill houses is represented by me. It's gerrymandered that way. So I have, I guess, a large part of it. And I go to Inwood, Washington Heights, West Harlem, Morningside Heights, Upper West Side, Midtown, and I go down to Chelsea, uh, where I am. Chelsea uh, Elliott Houses is in my district. I mean, a couple of buildings of it, not all of it. Uh, that's how they gerrymanned the 31st Senatorial District going back 10 years ago uh, when uh, uh, <clears throat> Elliott, Elliott, uh, uh, not Elliot Spitzer, uh, the way the state representatives was uh, the person that was trying to raise money in order to switch the leadership of the Senate from the Republican to Democrat, Eric Snyderman. And so they gerrymandered the district in order to try to knock him out of the box. And that's from a political point of view. And hopefully with the census now, uh, they can bring the districts back to a realistic approach as far as keeping it together. But so I wanted to come and listen. Obviously, I, I have some questions. Um, uh, I, I know that I would think I know what you want. Uh, you want to have a say. You want to be, be a part of the decision-making process. Uh, but I, my concern is how long is it going to take to reach that end result in order so that things can be done to rehab, improve services, and to have it to where residents can be happy about the development that they live in. I mean, obviously no one wants it to take five years and 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. Uh, I'm reading the report uh, put out by CSS and, and others. Uh, so, but I'm here to listen uh, most of the time. And I say to you that from a legislative point of view, I saw that uh, the legislation was put on hold. Uh, and I wanna know uh, from you as resident, resident leaders, how long are we gonna hold the legislation on hold? Um, until you know, you're at the table uh, discussing all of the details, that's fine. But I, I just, I need more information. I need to know, know really what your position is. And I say your position, the citywide, uh, residents uh, to preserve public housing. Um, and then I want to make sure that the areas that I represent, that uh, my people are at the table also to discuss and consider their specific developments, even though uh, I know this is not about one specific development, it's about the entire system and the, 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 uh, the concern about the fact that uh, public housing uh, will be shaped differently in the future uh, by Section 8 uh, versus Section 9. So that's my two cents. Um, I never said that I knew uh, a lot. Uh, I'd leave the details of that to my staff to deal with. And then I asked a lot of questions and asked for uh, memos and read documents in order to uh, make my decision overall where I'm coming from. But what I said to you, Marquise, um, when we were at uh, Dykeman Houses, uh, was it maybe how many years, months ago? Six months ago or something like that? <laughs> yeah, I give it to Five months ago, I said, I'm not going to do anything that, uh, that the residents don't feel that they need. 
Right. And, and just to be clear and, and transparent with everyone, I outright asked uh, Senator Robert Jackson if he would uh, take his name off the Public Housing Preservation Trust legislation. Um, we, we have discussed it. Uh, the residents to preserve public housing have been meeting for well over a year. Um, and, and again, right, this blueprint is not a viable option for us. One, um, because resident, what, residents weren't a part of it. It was created and then um, they try to get buy-in from residents. Um, two, it removes all of the federal protections or it forces us to renegotiate the federal protections that are already guaranteed to us under Section 9 and of course, uh, the legislation as it was currently written in its second iteration, there's no protection against foreclosure. So the Housing Authority recognizes that that is in fact a risk and there is little that they can do to address that risk. They have made it very clear with the legislation. We do um, have a ton of experts on this call who uh, would love to speak. So I am grateful um, and, and, and know that this is the way you operate when you come here and pose a question as opposed to saying, this is what I'm gonna tell you and you all should follow what I say. So thank you for <laughs> posing the question. Um, and I, I'm gonna look right now and see if there's um, any hands up or anyone who wants to start answering some of the questions that Senator Jackson posed? Marquise, but let me just say that I, I, I would, I hear that uh, no one wants to be able to transfer a public housing nature to, uh, you know, to a public private partnership with a guarantee. We guarantees have to be in there. If there's no guarantees, then, you know, I've seen a lot of, developers say they're going to develop property and then all of a sudden uh, properties have not been, I'm not, not talking about NYCHA developments, I'm talking about private property, hasn't been built, it's been vacant uh, for years, even though they started uh, the process to build, uh, you know, housing one block from my house and in which a synagogue uh, building was part of it. And they went bankrupt. They're in court and all kind of stuff. And it's been like that for years with boarded up and nothing has been done. Uh, so no one wants that uh, for sure. But in order to get the, uh, now they say $40 billion in order to take care of NYCHA, and it probably will be 50 billion really, you know. Uh, and let's, how are we gonna get that money from the feds and the city and the state in order to get that done? I mean, so, that's, a, that's a, I guess, multi $50 billion question. Uh, we we <laughs> definitely have some residents who want to take a stab at it. But what I also want to flag is that the blueprint for change proposal is a 10-year plan, right? So it's not like that is going to come in in the first year um, and automatically fix things up. In fact, the stimulus or the... Um, so what is it, the reconciliation bill, if passed, would bring in a lot more money a lot quicker uh, than this blueprint plan would if it were passed. Mm -hmm. um, and so the other ask, right, or the other piece of the conversation that I'm hoping that we can have or begin to have is continue state funding. We haven't had consistent um, state funding for a very long time. It's not to say that the state hasn't provided funding, but it hasn't provided adequate funding for quite some time. Um, and so that's the problem, right? We're not getting the adequate funding. So they believe that Section 8 is a, is a more stable source of funding. Um, and you can probably say more than that than I can. But the reality is, is that they're both government sources of funding and they risk the chances of government um, reducing the amount of money the difference is if they reduce the amount of money on public housing, then we don't get the repairs done and it continues to fall in disarray. Mm. If they don't get the money under the blueprint, then our homes go into foreclosure. Well, yeah, I mean, so if, if that's the case, then I think that that's the, the big hole that has to be plugged. Uh, so, I, I, you know, if, if you, for example, or the residents preserve public housing, uh, the, the legislation that I'm signed on to, if you're asking me 
to remove my name, uh, my understanding is that that has been put on hold. So nothing's going to happen with it, especially I believe you got that commitment from Brian Kavanaugh. Is that correct? If that's the case, then it's on hold uh, and discussions will take place. Um, but if in fact, you and the leaders uh, want people that have signed on to the legislation to remove their name. Uh, I mean, that can easily be done, but then remove it to what end? Uh, until, for example, a decision is made and we get the green light from the residents to preserve public housing, or why don't we just hold on to it until something happens? As long as it doesn't move, it's the main thing, in my opinion. Thank you, because I spoke a lot. I'm going to pass it to uh, Ms. Aita Torres from Smith Houses and then Ms. Dana Alden from St. Mary's Houses. Okay, where's the Smith Houses? Is that downtown Manhattan? Is that correct? In Brian it's Kavanaugh's district. Okay. And I, and I have to tell you that I've been a little bit perturbed with the senator, and I've actually told him because I felt that he should have called the resident leadership in his district to ask our opinion. He about the bill before he before the bill was submitted, you mean? Yes, that's right. Okay. Because I knew about it. And okay. and so my reaction was, and I'm still angry that there's no, you know, issue about that. I thought it was condescending, arrogant, right? To proceed with something without asking for our input. And a total violation of the 964. The problem with the blueprint is number one. At the end of the day, it will really, really not give us the money that we need to fix our, our developments. That's number one. Number two, it eliminates public housing as it is. And I have to tell you, in the last six, eight months, I was on a campaign to be the chairperson during the mayoral, the, to be the chairperson of NYCHA, because I know for a fact that when NYCHA was run by residents, for residents, NYCHA was, had a, actually had a reserve of billions of dollars, right? Um, this is not pulling a party line kind of thing, but once Giuliani, the Republicans came in, they took that reserve, literally raked NYCHA at the expense of the residents in public housing, we had to pick up the tab for the state buildings that were built by the state and the city so that NYCHA could continue to function. That's number one. The blue bill is definitely not acceptable in my eyes. The other great piece- that about, the, the, the blueprint, is that the, is that the legislation that- The Brian legislation, yeah, yes, okay. absolutely. Okay. And, he knows, and he knows how I feel, I've been very vocal. Aaron Rhodes, can I just say uh, one second? Aaron Rhodes, can you please uh, somebody send me uh, in the chat or send me to my email the, the uh, actual uh, legislation so I can see who signed on and the details of the legislation? Okay, go ahead. I'm sorry. Okay. And so, and so I feel like, you know, we have been totally disrespected in that sense that we were not caught part of the ninth, you know, which says we're supposed to be part of the process. There are other avenues and things that can be done. For some reason I'm echoing, so somebody must be open because I feel myself echoing, is that we can, there could be legislation, right? That will help us. And the other piece, the big piece for me, and I've been saying this since I've been resident leader in Alfred E. Smith houses is we're taxpayers. We pay taxes just like everybody else in New York State, we, we're demanding that we get back our tax dollars in quality. There's no reason why there cannot be a line item on the state level for public housing, right? And we also need to talk about resident management because I know I can run NYCHA a hell of a lot better than what it's being run. If nothing else, this pandemic has taught us this. And the reason I'm saying Amen. <laughs> and the reason I'm saying this is because everybody on this call is a resident leader, right? Who did what they needed to do for their residents. We I, I mean, we have survived death. 
We have mm-hmm. survived so many things and we managed to step up to the plate and give our residents what we needed. And anything that was done by NYCHA was when they were basically embarrassed. Um, so I, I, I'm gonna speak for Smith. I don't wanna speak for the other resident leaders, but I do know that we were totally slighted when they did the hero thing. They didn't, we weren't acknowledged for the work that was done, that people risked their lives to do what needed to get done to get food and supplies or whatever needed to be done for our residents. So we're quite capable of running our developments as is. And we also need to change the legislation on the authority and how it's built. I just found out that- I I got a stack. Okay, yeah, I know, but just give me, I just wanna finish this. I just found out that the legislation for the board of NYCHA, you, a resident, a resident, a resident of public housing cannot be the chairperson. Why? Why? We're educated and we know, and we sure as hell know a lot better what's going on in our developments than anybody else. So I thank you for respecting us for coming, you know, to listen to what we had to say. Senator, you're on mute. I, I would try to come on and and listen to what's being said on a continuous basis so I can be uh, constantly up to speed. And in essence, as a photographer, you always refocus about what you're doing. So thank you. Thank and, and I'm going to speak to Brian about the legislation and, and get his opinion. No, really, you know, because I want to hear what he has to say, you know. Okay, uh, go ahead. Well, Yeah, I mean, whatever he had to say, but the bottom line is he never asked, at least the resident leaders in his development. And it's not like we're not, we're not vocal, at least to me. I'll I'll speak for myself, not for the rest of the district, but, you know. Thank you. I'm going to, Ms. Dana. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon and welcome, Senator Jackson. Uh, Thank you so much for taking the time to come into our meeting today. Um, My name is Dana Eldon and I'm the president of St. Mary's Park Houses. Um, At St. Mary's Park Houses, we run a COVID-19 resource center. We feed our residents, our homebound. We have other programs that we do as well. So we are quite active. And that's in the Bronx, is that correct? That is correct, sir. Um, As a senior, a disabled senior, um, I have to tell you that the blueprint is frightening to many seniors as it forcibly will make us all Section 8. Not everyone is eligible for Section 8. Some have pensions and have worked hard all of their lives and now they're being told that they're gonna make them section eight when their incomes are not viable to section eight. So what happens is that they're gonna be forced to be paying market rent for their apartments, which yeah, they cannot can afford. I, Dana, can, and, and somebody help me. Basically what I've read is that, uh, that when it's go to section eight, it's still one third 30% of the family's income, everyone that lived in the in that particular unit. So Section 8, Section okay. 8 has an income uh, cap. So I think they make it fair. Yeah, Marquee. Marquee. yeah I think I, it, the, the, the calculation that you're speaking of, Senator, is correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, but nonetheless, there is a cap on how much money you can make in Section 8. Okay. Whereas in public housing, there mm-hmm. is no cap. Right. Um, Yeah. And and that is a problem, Senator, that many are above that limit. Right. And I would think think that in order for that to happen, if if in fact NYCHA and those who have the authority want to be able to make sure that the money comes in to do the rehabs and what have you so forth, then obviously, in my opinion, based on everyone that lives there, uh, it's still entitled to the 30% of the family's gross income uh, 
and not then now be uh, saying that because you know you have a pension, you have this, and now you're going to have to pay more than 30%. You may have to pay 50, 60% or market rate. No, that's not acceptable. I, I don't think that that's acceptable. No, no. So in public housing, let's and, say, for example, you make $100,000. Mm -hmm. In public housing, you are able to stay as your income grew to $100,000. Mm -hmm. right. As a as Section 8... As, as long 8, as you pay 30% of your family income. Is that that's correct? That's right. Yeah. That's yeah. right. But a Section and, 8... And there, there, are many, there are many residents who are paying the cap. Right. The current cap. Mm -hmm. um, and so... With that conversion to Section 8, the mm -hmm. cap is well under what they may pay if they're not accepted as a Section 8 resident. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that, that is, is a, a big that's concern. A major concern. That's a major concern. Yes. 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 Okay. That that's that's good to know. So for so for myself and the 34% of residents right. that live in St. Mary's who are seniors, 34%. we are well. 34%. Mm -hmm. And I'm quite sure, Senator, if you look at NYCHA's uh, numbers, as far as the city is concerned, a high number of residents are seniors mm -hmm. throughout the city. Um, it is quite frightful for us, knowing that we're not safe under Section 8. Okay. Um, so, and everyone is, it's not, Section 8 isn't for everyone. And some of us would like to remain Section 9. So this blueprint, which forcibly will make us Section 8, is, is my, in my, my, my voice, um, it's, it's horrible. It's, 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 it's incredible that someone would, would bully us into a situation. Not only do that, but they have people going around to apartments, knocking on doors to seniors, no doubt, and says to, to the seniors, you have to sign the Section 8, which is, it's, it's, it should be illegal to do something like that. It's a scare tactic. Yeah, they don't, and, and no, the, no one should be forced into signing anything. And to tell them that they're going to get new this and that, it's, it, I've, we've seen RAD, we've seen PAC, we've seen what, what NYCHA has done. Uh, they, 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 they a bow, a ribbon bow around things to make it look pretty, but in essence, they're not doing what they need to do for the infrastructure of our developments, and it has to stop, and, okay. and the blueprint must be killed. So, thank you, so, sir. Uh, Dana, so what I, what I heard loud and clear is that, you know, you and other residents that are above the current cap are afraid if that happens, then their rent is going to be increased above the 30% or at market rate. Is that correct? Loud and clear. Either, either way, either way, it's, it's a death sentence okay. to many uh, because if that, you if know, that was we dealt, don't want to fix incomes. If that was dealt with, if that was dealt with, that would then, well, what would you say about it at that point in time? If that was dealt with, let's well, check anyway. I'm just well, asking. My question. position is, I, I understand. Thank you for that question. But but my position is that I would like to remain Section 9. There are also other issues with Section 8 that don't give us a voice that we need to have to represent our residents. And if, then if that's a, if you're saying, I, you know, um, you know, many people don't like change. And so if in fact, if, if in fact we, meaning when I say we, NYCHA is going to change from Section 9 to Section 8, uh, and that one issue you talked about is a very legitimate issue uh, as far as the cap uh, now and no cap in Section 8, but then you said there's other issues of Section 8. And I would hope that Marquise, uh, that the Residence Preserves Public Housing, your work group here at the leadership, uh, make have a list of those things other than what was Dana mentioned uh, as far as issues and concerns with Section 8. Yes, you're so here. Me, I, I do want to see, I want to see all of the elevators are working, the roofs are not, uh, not leaking and all of the mold and all of the things that everybody else wants, you know what I mean? Uh, so that's just, you know, that's what I'm, I'm looking at and I'm listening to exactly what you're saying, uh, Dana. 
And then that's why I said, if there's a list, Marquise, of other issues of concerns with Section 8, so I can see this entire list. And so- uh, Absolutely. The, we, discussion we have, uh, the discussions and negotiations at every level, especially the federal level, may be necessary. Absolutely, Senator. We have letters that we have shared with our elected officials that mm -hmm. go through that list. Yeah. Um, but also, as we go through the stack, you'll hear more um, about the different concerns that we have with the blueprint and, and why we say no to okay. the blueprint. Um, I have Mr. Robert Hall, Beverly McFarlane, uh, Beverly McFarlane, and then Mr. Reginald Bowman. Uh, Mr. Hall, I'm giving you the floor. Hey. Uh, Senator Jackson, uh, I'm Robert Hall. I'm from Gun Hill Houses. This is me right here. I I met you, yeah, I met you at Marble Hill, okay? As we waited for Mr. Edwards to arrive, okay? Um, first of all, I want to thank you for being candid and being open about your position as it lends itself to this entire situation, all right? Uh, you're very open and you want to listen and you want to learn. And that's a good thing. And I sincerely hope that all of the remaining senators feel the same way that you do, with an open mind. All right. Now, Ms. Eldon brought out a very good point with regards to uh, Section 8 versus Section 9. And one of the other entities that I want to bring into play is the fact that we need to be heard. You will not be heard once you gather yourselves with Section 8. When you get with another non-for-profit, that non-for-profit has their own board of directors, they have their own progressive uh, goals, and they move forward at their own rate. Yet and still, residents in public housing, when I say public housing, I'm talking about low-income housing, low and very low-income housing, they know very little about those types of procedures that go on from a Section 8 standpoint of view, all right? NYCHA was very, very crafty in doing this during the pandemic, all right? During this pandemic, most of the presidents spent a lot of time trying to make sure that the residents got what they needed just to survive. We were not on the front lines to fight this battle. However, I just received word about a week ago that our highest representation, which is the Citywide Council of Presidents, the CCOP chair had to sign a notice so that everyone will now understand that everything that goes on on a level with NYCHA and the residents, there needs to be transparency. I thought it was embarrassing that a notice of transparency even has to come up at this point. But that's how crafty NYCHA has been. That's how disillusioned they have been over a long period of time because what they've done is kept the presidents busy at odds and trying to maintain their mere survival during this pandemic while they marched on to try to privatize the developments. It was very crafty on their part. And now that things have somewhat simmered to a certain degree, we have to come up with uh, transparency documentations in order to be heard, all right? And this is from a capital project standpoint of view. All right, that had to happen from our citywide chair. All right, a notice had to actually come out so that everybody comes above board. And I thought that was quite embarrassing because this is something that should have taken place from the inception. And that is what our battle is. Our battle is to be heard. Once this money comes in and there will be some funding coming in, we don't know exactly what the numbers will be. But we're going, to, we're going to need assistance, and I understand that. But yet and still, it is very important that transparency in, in its fullest form take place above the board. And that has not been happening to this point. So I, I kind of want you to understand that as you evaluate some of the circumstances that we're dealing with 
uh, pertaining to this situation regarding uh, Section 8 versus Section 9, all right? A lot has to do with what we bring to the table, all right? So thank you. Thank you for hearing me, Senator. Without a doubt, uh, I'm here to listen and learn, and, and I'm taking notes also, and Erin Rose, as our policy director, is also taking notes. And she put in the chat uh, the, the piece of legislation that uh, Brian Kavanaugh has uh, put forward, in which I had signed on as the co-sponsor. So I'm, I'll be printing that out. Uh, you know, one thing is to read it online, another thing is I like to print it out to have it and look at all of the pages. So thank right. you. Well, thank you, Robert. I appreciate okay. that. Thank you. Okay. And next we have Ms. Beverly, Beverly McFarlane. Good, uh, good afternoon, Senator Jackson. Hi, Beverly. How are you? I'm fine. Um, my issue with the- Where's your residence the located at? Oh, I am the resident council president for um, Taft, Senator Robert A. Taft Houses in East Harlem. How are you? Yeah, okay. Okay. Um, section eight, section nine, we are governed. We are already governed federal mandated. We have federal um, protection underneath the 964 regs. And at the point at I believe it's the CRF 100.25, it states that at the point of conception, we were supposed to be sitting at the table. So NYCHA is in full violation of the, we um, wasn't even at the table with the blueprint for change. Num number two is the blueprint for change have a tr uh, uh, trust. At, on the board of trust is four, um, is nine is a nine people a person's trust, where is four people on this trust is, is residents, um, NYCHA residents, and the five is other elective and uh, a chair, the chair. My problem is that sounds like a conflict of interest because why would the chair of NYCHA that's going to be, um, it will be on this trust. And why is it only four residents? Because then that means we will not have a, a full say, we will never be the majority of what will be happening in our developments or in our homes because we don't hold the majority of the seats of this board. Second, secondly, just like um, uh, the, the young lady was saying in terms of section eight, section eight, we have to um, have a certain uh, income criteria. And if we do not fall in that income criteria, then what happens is that it goes based on the AMI of that area. So our rent will be an, an, um, increased based on the AMI of the area that you live in. Well, so AM, the AMI, as you know, for New York, it's, it's an AMI for New York City. Uh, correct. And, and so it's not like, you know, there's one, an AMI for the Bronx and one for Brooklyn, one for Queens. The AMI yeah, is every, based everywhere on the in the AMI, city. Yeah, you will. Our rent will be increased up to thirty percent of the income. But if 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 that whole issue, especially for rehabbing, a hundred and ten units uh, out of the hundred and seventy something, I mean that that's something that needs to be dealt with at the table, if if at all, that can be dealt with as far as the income gap. You know what I mean? That was discussed earlier with Dana. You know. Yeah, but you heard. also, but what, what you have to understand is. NYCHA have removed one third of their housing stock already from uh, through PAC and RAD. And if, if we are given the $40 billion that, is, um, that um, uh, Chuck Schumer is trying to fight for, why then why would we have to go from section eight to section nine anyway? Why wouldn't they just preserve public housing? They, they, this have been preventive maintenance um, the lack of preventive maintenance of NYCHA for all these years, um, and where is the money? We first of all, we really need a forensic audit of where the money is going to. Period. It just seems like we have not. There's no accountability of what they're doing with the money now because, be, 
right now, what NYCHA is doing is strong arming us and saying, if we do not sign off to the blueprint for change, they're not fixing our apartments. They're not fixing our buildings. They're not, you know, when we call the 718 number, it tells us that's why we should sign off at the blueprint for change. But is it, is it, is it, is it, is it because basically uh, the, the federal government and the state and the city is not pumping in enough money in order to make the commitment for the repairs uh, and the rehabs. I mean, uh, some developments have, have you know, you, you have the whole elevators and the roofs and, and everything else that needs to be rehabbed, you know? And so it's about, it's about the money. And, and I guess what uh, by, by section, from RAD and Section 8 is, is uh, the public-private partnership. And I heard Marquise and others talked about the protection about if in fact something should happen, then basically uh, the housing development that's happening in that may go into foreclosure and it will be up to grabs to, by any private developer if in fact they're gonna try to do that in order to uh, address that. But all of that has to be dealt with at the table at a level up here. Do you know what I mean? I don't think that that's going to be made uh, with at NYCHA with resident leaders and other leaders that are not resident leaders from NYCHA because that, that's going to be, have to be done at the federal, and in my opinion, at the federal level. Because when you're talking about the money, the money's for Section 9 is majority federal money and then also for section eight you're talking about also federal money also so but i hear the issue and concern uh and i think that those have to be addressed once they're on the table uh, at every level yeah but that's what i'm saying we already governed by the 964 regs that clearly mm -hmm. states that we are what's supposed to be at the table pond conception and it was okay. valid if in fact you, I heard you say in the beginning, from the beginning it said that the, the residents are supposed to be at the table. Well, if if in fact whatever agreement that says that, then you have to make sure that that agreement is adhered to. Or if it's not an agreement, if it's a is if it's part of the requirements of 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 Section Nine or how NYCHA whatever, then you you need to be at the table from the beginning. That's, right. There's no ends if or buts. It's and we, a, and that's my point. We were never at the table. And, the and you know what? You know what I say. Uh, I'm from Missouri. Show me. It's a show me state. So show me the regulations where you say you need to be at the table from the beginning. And then. And I just said it's 964 CRF, but I believe it's 100.25 or 110. But I will give Marquise that information because I have it on my phone. That okay. is it. And I, I'm, I'm going to ask Aaron Rose to make a note of that because obviously, if, if as you cite, if that's what it is, that's what it is, and that's what we need to make sure. And I'd say this to you, uh, Beverly, and everybody else. Listen, I've been involved in litigation uh, from the campaign for fiscal equity as the lead plaintiff in a lawsuit that sued the state of New York. They were not providing enough funds for our children to get a sound basic education. Uh, it took 13 years of litigation. Uh, but we won, uh, and the end result was billions of dollars more from a capital point of view with that Pataki signed at a warehouse in Brooklyn that now sits Sunset Park High School, $11.2 billion. And then Elliot Spitzer, as the governor, agreed uh, uh, to $5.5 billion for New York City education. And just recently in this legislative session that, we, that ended uh, in uh, April, uh, it was, they, they made whole on what we were entitled to, which is $4.2 billion, $1.4 billion over the next three years. So believe me, I know uh, the legal processes. And that's why I said, I'm from Missouri, you got to show me. And so right. Aaron, Rose, Aaron Rose, make a note of that so we could see what Beverly is making reference to. Okay. And, and, oh. one, and one more thing I could say, and I'll be done. Um, okay. He, um, Gregory Russ have went to five different states and abolished public housing. So this is his. Uh, he is the hitman for NYCHA. 
Okay. okay. That's it. Thank you. If in fact that's his, his MO at five different states, we know that's his MO. We have to make sure that doesn't happen. And that's his and, MO. So you can look that up. That's Google him. Google him. Uh, and not only that, he's also his, uh, his father-in-law is a developer of all some of these projects that he is um, uh, taking over. So we'll, I'll, I'll put together I'll put together a packet to send that I include all of those stories, especially our friends from Minneapolis, uh, his hometown, who are still battling with some of the things that he made. Uh, keeping us moving with Stack. Uh, the last thing I'll say about the the rights and the regulations is one thing to have those rules and regulations. It's another to protect them. Right? We have struggled with protecting those rules and regulations. We have caught NYCHA numerous times. In fact, we've lost count of how many times NYCHA had violated our rights um, and protections. And, it's most, and and they're able to do it because of our lack of ability um, to have legal representation, right? That goes all the way in making sure that those federal protections are adhered to. So that's also part of the ask, right? How can we strengthen residents' um, ability to hold the housing authority accountable Mm -hmm. And maybe that could look like a part of money that goes to the CCAP or other residents where they're able to retain a lawyer. Um, but that also, Marquise would also make sure that the elected public officials that represent uh, the development and uh, on the housing committee and the city council uh, and housing committee and state legislature, then we would then uh, step up and communicate and hold them accountable. That's right. So I'm going to give you Mr. Reginald Bowman, former CCOP chair. Okay. I remember Reginald going back. Good afternoon. How are you? What's up, brother? How you doing? Good. Um, it's good to talk to a Upward Bound alumni. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we go back to when you were the school board president prior to the campaign for fiscal equity and as you know, you and I have been in contact over the years on several different issues. Um, first of all, um, I want to commend um, Marquise and the, the, the group for continuing their efforts to focus the residents of public housing and putting together what I would like to call the campaign for fiscal equity for public housing. Um, <laughs> Without a doubt, um, we need to get focused like and learn from, uh, they say if you don't learn from the past, you're destined to repeat it. That's true. Uh, we need to focus this campaign uh, so that we can be laser focused and then um, organized enough to make sure that going forward, we can get some of the things that we want. Mm -hmm. um, I just, you know, very briefly, I'm gonna take three minutes at most Marquise. Um, yes, we are in a dire straits here because the public housing stock of the city of New York needs to be modernized, uh, repaired, um, upgraded, and brought into the 21st century. We are in the year 2021. We are two decades and a year into the 21st century, or let's just say a quarter of the way through. And we're still talking about the same things and not getting too much done. Um, I would like to propose as we're on this conversation that going forward, um, since the legislation has been paused, that we need to bring NYCHA, the legislators and everybody to the table and pause this entire blueprint slash packed plan and um, reorganize our efforts towards uh, what we wanna see happen with our homes from 2022 forward. Um, in my opinion, um, that would be something that would refocus what we need to do and it would um, generate the type of, of, of energy that we need to energy and strategic planning that we need to make sure that 
we get the resources, the funding, and the actual plans that we do need to face the critical issues in our developments at this time. Uh, the final thing I'd like to say is that um, quite a few years ago in 2012, um, we put together uh, something called the, the strategic plan uh, or setting the agenda for public housing going ahead. And part of that was uh, finding a way to um, make sure that we get the consistent funding that we need. And as we are now in the last quarter of the legislative year of, of, of the state and the federal government, um, we as residents have to be clear as to what it is that we actually want to be in this legislation and to be in the, um, the capital plans for NYCHA uh, and the, the infrastructure and NYCHA plans going forward. So I said all that to say this, I, I think that, you know, we are, we are making progress as a group, as of residents and finding our way to the table, but we need to make sure that we really focus our efforts in a real campaign for the uh, infrastructure modernization, capital and management of the New York City Housing Authority going forward. I think that focusing our efforts on those things uh, collectively and putting together a real campaign that's going to um, raise our voices and put pressure on the state and the federal government to get the funds that we need to deal with the current capital and then also um, finish dealing with the status we're at with the monitoring agreement and all the rest of the issues i think we need to make sure that we pull all of those things together to make those things happen uh the final thing i'm going to say is you know there's a lot of blame to go around about what's wrong and who did what but after we finish um uh identifying the issues and the people and the problems uh, we need to have a definitive plan and campaign going forward so that we can make sure that we don't spend another uh, 21 years uh, trying to make sure that we get the things done we need in capital repairs and management and operation of the New York City Housing Authority. So, um, Senator, I, I appreciate your, 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 your efforts. I'm a student of what you did with the campaign for fiscal equity. And I hope that uh, part of what will come out of this meeting today will be the focusing of this uh, group on a real campaign and identifying uh, a strategic plan for getting the funding, the legislation, the restoration and the budgeting uh, together to deal with the issues that we're faced with in our developments. And I, so that, I yield you. back the floor. It's always good to see you. And, and I'm glad that you are still involved because I think that we need to have leaders that have been there in the past uh, with new leaders that are coming up and, and just constantly refocus about what needs to be done. And so we have to have a roadmap uh, for, uh, to, to, to make sure that the money is gotten there from feds and from the city and the state. And, I think that every legislator that represents uh, a housing development uh, needs to step up totally and work in concert with the resident leaders in order to get it done. Uh, and I just hope that the money uh, is going to be there from the federal government and state government in order to make that happen. So uh, I, I'm hoping to, uh, by joining you today and joining in future uh, meetings, uh, to be up to speed totally uh, when we go back in January up to Albany. One other question before we go. Um, so are the sessions in Albany finished for the year? Oh, yeah, yeah. That, that we, 
Uh, we left the uh, last day up in Albany was June 10th. Uh, and then we came back with an emergency session called by the governor to deal with the uh, ERAP, the Emergency Rental Assistance Program. Uh, and we don't go back until the first Wednesday of January. But as soon as we go back, we're gonna be dealing with the, the ERAP again. And some of them are calling it the CRAP, the COVID Rental Assistance Program. Uh, because the deadline is January 15th, and quite frankly, there's not enough money to deal with all of the people that are in need. So we're going to have to go back and deal with that. And that's why uh, Governor Hochul is communicating from the feds that we need more money from the feds. And we're going to... Oh, on, that, on that note, just yeah. one other thing since you brought that up. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you're aware of it or not, but the ERAP program is not processing the applications from public housing because of something that's going on. So uh, I hope that um, the state officials um, will look into that. Or if you know, uh, as an aside, if someone from your staff, I know I'm from Brooklyn, but if someone from your staff could uh, give me uh, some insight into- Well, let me give you the, the state. I'm, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm juggling at the same time. I'm doing laundry and <laughs> on your media. But I know the feeling. And I'm listening uh, at everything that's been said. So with that, with that because- um, Because they're saying that they're not going to process the public housing. Right. That public housing uh, goes at the, at, the, at, the, at the end of the line, basically. Yeah. Along with, along with besides, pu because public housing- uh, people are paying 30% of their gross income, whereas the, everyone else, they're paying full top dollar. Market rate, yeah. Yeah, so they supposedly, uh, NYCHA is at the end of the line. You know who else is at the end of the line? Uh, those municipalities like Rochester, like Yonkers, and I forgot, uh, maybe Syracuse, that opted out of the state ERAP program and yeah. they develop with the funds that they have their yeah. own quote unquote ERAP program. Mm -hmm. So they've run out of money. And so they go at the end of the line. Uh, because, you know, obviously there's individuals that uh, don't have subsidized rent or that are, you know, that were not part of the ERAP program that opted out. Those are the ones that are dealing with first. So thank you. And I, as I said, uh, everyone knows that what we have is not enough money to take care of everyone. So that's so what we're going to have to go back to. Thank you, Senator. Them. I yield the floor, Mr. Marquis. Thank you. And in case you know, um, Mr. Bowman still sits uh, proudly and boldly on the C Cup, and he is their legislative director. So he provides a lot of direction to us, and we're extremely appreciative of having him with us and standing side by side with us and giving us direction. Um, there were two things I will mention that I just want to um, sort of break up so that folks are all on the same level. Uh, you heard the term AMI. AMI stands for Area Medium Income. It is the calculation that is used uh, to, um, to calculate how much someone should be paying in rent. In other words, it totals up all the income in New York City and then determines uh, where people sit um, in terms of um, the level of income they generate. So if you're in the 30 AMI um, or the 30% area media income, you might be making somewhere between 70 and $80,000, 70 and $80,000 a year. Uh, the other thing is the ERAP. The ERAP, if you're not familiar, is the Emergency Rent to Assistance uh, program and that is helping folks who uh, suffered hardship uh, and struggling with paying their rent due to COVID-19 um, and other uh, related issues. Um, we still have a stack. The next person we have on stack, uh, please introduce uh, who you are and title, Mr. Joel Kufferman. Joel, are you still on the line? We may have lost Joel. We may have lost Joel, but we do have... Aisa, I'm not sure if you have your hand up or not. Um, do, we, but Joel... Marquis, I'm trying to get in. Who's that? Is that uh, Ronald? Yes it, yes, it is. 
So okay, I already let me spoke, hear, let so me Ronald, Ronald wanted to speak? Yes, but did you want to say something before Ronald speaks? Yeah, I wanted to, to, to add to what you just added about the income that, for instance, for Smith, a studio in my immediate area across the street is running for three to four thousand dollars a month. That's a studio. So if we had to pay rent based on you know the going market rate, we could not afford it, especially for the seniors. Right now, Alfred E. Smith is like we have like 75% of the residents are seniors, right? Most of them have a pension and social security. We probably wouldn't qualify, but we also could not afford to pay the going rate. Smith is NYCHA's most valuable asset at this point, but I think that across the board, that's true of all the development in NYCHA because we're now sitting on waterfront property across the city, right? Or we live like two blocks from the beach. So now everybody wants to do that. Um, and so we would literally, under the Section 8, be um, incomed out of our homes because, because we go into Section 8, you know. So I just wanted to add to that, that the value, when you talk about the value and the city value and stuff, it's outrageous, literally outrageous what would happen. I Just very short. I wrote a grant. I was told to write this grant. When I put in my zip code, I got kicked out because of my zip code. Mm. Okay. Thank, thank you, Ronald. Ronald, I'm going to give you the floor now. Okay. Thank, thank you so much, um, Senator Robert Jackson. It's a pleasure to have you come on. My name is Ronald Topping. I'm from the Adam Houses um, in the South Bronx. Um, okay. So there are just a few things. Um, when I, the, the conversations earlier about the Section A from Section 9 to Section 8, you know, first of all, um, there's not enough monies to go into Section 8 to, you know, to help people here in New York City. Congress has not funded HUD in such a long time that we are under the belt. So that's what the first problem is. Then they decided to bring in a, a CEO after a show I told her was dismantled and removed. Well, um, and we um, went down to City Hall to fight to get a removal. Some of the people on the call have were, were witnesses to that, so we had to go in front of Judge Pauly and 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 try to dismantle that sort of thing. So then he, our mayor, without talking to us, goes into getting rid of sixty-two thousand units and not speaking to any of the resident leadership because one of the things I believe they they contemplate is that we do not read. And that's a false narrative that they try to present about our people that live in pu public housing. So then Greg Russ comes into the city and he wants to intentionally confuse us with this transformation plan. And all that does is, is, is part, it's part of the blueprint. It's, it's basically there to restructure us um, according to the federal monitors agreement, which we had fought to get a federal monitor here. Then it goes to the stabilization plan that he wants to do. And this is uh, something that was created by new state agencies about the preservation trust. And it's only to help line the pockets of realtor investors of wealthy people that's already wealthy. So when you have this man coming here to help dismantle public housing. And basically he's been to four other cities and, and probably a lot more than that, that's already displaced a lot of Samoan people, okay? In Minneapolis, his own, his own state. Mm -hmm. then, he, then he goes to Philadelphia and he, his behind gets sued, okay? Because they don't want to do the earned income credit for people who have finally get a job and then they want to go up and start raising their rent. So that's another issue. So his butt got sued there. Then he takes his butt over to Boston. He displaced people. Then he wants to come 
He went to Chicago. They got rid of Cabrini Green, which we know has a large historical history of public housing residents. And what they don't fail, they fail to realize is that public housing residents are some of the finest people you're going to find here in the world as well, along with New York City. You have some of the most brilliant and talented people who live in public housing. The playing field was never equal, so this is where we resided. They wanted us to move on because it wasn't created for us, but now they see that, that we're here, and now they just want to throw us out and just as like a wet food stamp. That's not going to happen because we're not going to move. We're going to stand in this fight, and we're going to try to get answers. We need people like yourselves to hey, start man. to one another, collaborating cohesively, coherently, mm -hmm. and working together to try to save New York City. But this is his baby, what he wants to try to dismantle. And these people on this call and all our residents are going to stand up and fight against them. Hey, I'm going to get to that. The answer. Thank you. Thank but I'm closing, Borrowing money is never going to be the answer. But what we do say is that when you don't, when you switch it from Section Nine to Section Eight, and there's not enough funding for Section Eight, market rate steps in. That's the other option that they have, which causes displacement. As Dana told you earlier, we have a large population of seniors. We are there, and a lot of disabled people. They are not going to be able to match those real. Um, 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 rental rental um, status of monies. We're not going to be able to do this. So I just wanted to share just a little bit of information. You could do your homework on Mr. Russ and what have you, because we already did. Um, Teals and Tally is one of the managing companies that he gains the profit if they came to New York. They'll get office downtown and they'll become more richer and while we become homeless. So this is the, 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 the thing is with, with Mr. Russ. So okay. I, even though okay. I came out attacking him um, and so forth. I just needed you yeah. to know what's been happening across okay. the state. Okay, so talking yeah. right now. Sorry, this is Ron, Ronald. Can you? This is Ron, that's Ronald, Ronald Toppings. Toppings. Yes, Ronald okay. Toppings. Ronald, Ron, Ronald, what what development are you from? Ronald, I'm in Adam Houses in the South Bronx. Okay. Okay, so I, I would encourage you to do some homework yeah. on what Mr. Russ has already done. So that you can weigh his out because he's he's he does nothing but hand in a uh, template. He doesn't change much of his views. Most people would be wise enough to change some of their movements. Yeah, but have he yeah, I know. Have you all talked to Eric Adams, the incoming uh, uh, mayor? Have you all met with him? We we have spoken with. But he does um, not have a clear plan on basically how he's going to help us get money. The main key is we got to get money. Right. Let me um let me say um because I'm going to continue on with that. But we spoke to uh candidate um Eric Adams when we did our mayoral forum. I forget what month we did it, but he did come to speak with us and talk about public housing. Um, so we're hoping to schedule a follow-up meeting with him uh, before he is officially, or if he's in this, um, before the official election takes place um, in November. But yes, we are trying. We're, we're going after everyone we can get. We can get a meeting with. Um, so again, thank you so much for coming. Keep me. Um, let me know what your timing is. I just want to make sure I leave a little bit of time for you to do some closing statements. No, I'm 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 listening to every what what everyone is saying. And so I, I if you if your next meeting is two weeks from now, I may be out of the country. But if I'm in the country, uh, I will be at the next meeting. Uh, I, if I can zoom in uh, from Tanzania, East Africa, then I'll zoom in if I can. Or you can just bring us all with you and we can just all have a <laughs> uh, But let me go to Mr. Joe. Joe, Hi. can you introduce yourself, please? Uh, did you say Joel? Yes. Yeah. Robert Jackson, I think you remember me for a long time. I'm one of your constituents. I'm yeah. counsel to Smith Houses in St. Nick. And it's just a few things. They cited the law, my predecessor speakers, I think know the law better than 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 the lawyers, you know, in this case. And I think it's really important that you really withdraw the legislation that's going. You mean withdraw yeah. my you name? Pointed from out it? that you how long you were involved in litigation. Yes, Joe, because you, you also mentioned litigation. 
I'm sorry. Hello. Oh, you said. Can I, we draw you, your name from from? from it, it's from very choppy. Uh, I'll, I'll take a look at that uh, and discuss that with Aaron Rose, and and I will consider that, Joe. Okay, but also I want to say that it's accountability. By putting this into a trust, you're removing one step more of the accountability. The, part of the problem that of all my experience with NYCHA and spending is this, the privatization of the work, the design work, the planning, and the contractors are getting plenty of millions of dollars and not coming through, and NYCHA's failed to do that. And New York State has received they're signed off on, on almost a billion dollars from FEMA money, signing off saying that they have to meet federal laws. The money went to, to, to NYCHA. The state had, can play a much bigger role in controlling the waste that's going on. We also try to bring NYCHA to bring speak to the state agencies, including DEC, including um, the health department, and they refuse to. So we could show you ways that this could really help New York State, a lot of money is being spent on flood mitigation. It's going to areas outside of NYCHA territories. So there's no reason why a lot of the budget problems could be solved by just focusing that NYCHA developments are entitled to. Thank you, Joe. Comment on Cynthia. Cynthia, you put in the chat. Where has it been established that Eric Adams is the new mayor when the official election has not taken place? And I hate to be so bold, but this is the only thing that politicians listen to. No, Cynthia, I mean, uh, uh, with Cynthia, if, if you look at, there are four, five, four, five Democrats to every Republican. And if you think that uh, Curtis Lewa will be elected the mayor, I, I, I want to know what you're drinking. <laughs> I'll, drink, I'll drink some of that. But no, I, I'm just saying, I, real, let me just finish, please. I'd if, be more than happy to respond finish, to that. Okay, just let me finish. And, and, I'll, and I'll be glad to listen to your response. Because from a realistic analysis point of view, uh, Eric Adams will be the next mayor. And if, in fact, NYCHA, this uh, residence to preserve public housing, should meet with uh, Eric and also meet with Curtis. Hey, meet with both of them. But... In, in my opinion, uh, it's it's uh, it's a given that uh, that Eric Adams will be the next mayor. So okay, now and I'll listen to you, please. Go before ahead. you before you say so, uh, that's a plug. Uh, Curtis will be with us next Sunday. So oh, good, I'll, that's I'll good. <laughs> All right, go, go ahead. So, so no offense, no. I'm only drinking water. Okay, so <laughs> I, I, I don't feel that that was very I'm, nice of you to say. I'm sorry, okay. I, I was just making water. a point. Well, yeah. I was just making a point that the elections yeah. have not happened yet. I actually sit on Manhattan Democrats. I am a county committee member, okay? okay? I did sit on one of the forums that, and I was in the debate with Eric Adams okay. when he was first running, okay? But he would not. And we had a whole thing with NYCHA presidents mm -hmm. and he dismissed us. Mm. That's what I'm drinking. When okay. I sit there and I talk to you and I tell you that this is what Gregory Russ is doing to us, mm -hmm. that this is how packed and rad is not working in New York City and you dismiss me, then I am going to question it. I'm not going for Curtis, even mm -hmm. though he's going to be on, but the elections are not until November. So no offense, but as a senator, everyone's entitled to their day of voting. Everyone's entitled to their opinion. And right. I take offense at what you said about me. Okay. So that's what I'm drinking. Okay, Cynthia, I apologize. I mean, I'm, I'm drinking water and coffee myself, um, but uh, okay, and we will wait to see what happens in November, but I do think that the, the uh, resident to preserve public housing should meet with uh, both of them. It should meet with Jamani Williams, who's a public advocate. He's uh, not our public advocate. He spends more time upstate yeah. than he does in the city. Okay. okay, if he wanted to be our public advocate, he'd step his foot in public housing. He well, has not done that. Okay, well, I, I, do, I do think that Joe should request a meeting with him. I, as I said to you, my commitment is if I'm available, I want to listen to every two weeks that you have your meeting to see what's being discussed and, and where we're going. Uh, just like I said, I will take 
uh, and look at the bill in order to move my name from the bill. I will let Marquise know and let you all know uh, it, it's either yes, I will, or no, I won't, and the reasons why. So I'm, 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 I'm about the majority of us on this call are NYCHA presidents. Okay, I'm about transparency. I'm about they do trans not speak with us. I'm about transparency and honesty in the process. So, uh, okay. transparency is that the top elected oh. officials, as the public advocate, do not recognize the TA leaders. Mm -hmm. And we, we're going to change that. But let me keep us going with that because I have thank a you, couple. Cynthia, thank you. And I, no I, I appreciate what you had to say. And, and I, I apologize for just, you know, saying what you're drinking. You're drinking okay. water. I'm drinking water and coffee myself. Okay. <laughs> thank you. I love my peoples. Um, I have um, Teresa Richardson. And then I'm going to uh, go to Mr. Tony Edwards. Good evening, everybody. Senator Robert Jackson, Teresa Richardson from the East River Houses. Sure. I just wanted you to know we spoke to the lower part of Manhattan, the top of Manhattan, all of Bronx, <laughs> but East River is in the middle of Manhattan, and we're all on the same page. And welcome, <laughs> welcome. And we meet every Sunday, I think, right, Marquis? So please, even yeah. if you don't speak, come and Zoom with us. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. I, I will. Because I want to be, I want to be as knowledgeable as possible, especially from the resident leaders are concerned. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Tony Edwards. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, Senator. How you doing? What's up, Tony? How you? I'm doing okay. Um, before I get started with anything, if you can see this, this flyer. What's happening, NYCHA's Compliance Department, they're actually coming up in Marble Hill on Tuesday to speak with the residents and ask them what their concerns are. Okay. With that being said, the concerns up here is, basically goes back to the, um, the flooding or the, uh, the rainstorm we had the, uh, uh, a couple of weeks ago. Okay, now. A lot of our uh, apartments end up becoming flooded. In my case, my two back rooms, they got flooded out. Um, the property manager sent one of her superintendents up to my apartment to assess what the damage was and come to find out the water is actually coming through the brick. Now they have scaffolding up all over this place, but yet no work has been done on, on the brick replacement. And so I've asked her, when will the work begin? And her, from her view, it will not begin no time soon. Uh, she stated something about like the, the equipment that's needed for all the rigging that's needed for them to hang off the side of the building. They're having problems with that. The contractors are having problems with that. But going back to what I was saying about the flooding, it was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, not only was my apartment affected, the apartments above me and apartments below me, you know. And throughout the development, I know there were issues with, um, with residents as well. And so the only thing that the manager was able to do to appease everybody was to send out uh, cleanup teams. Uh, people with like um, this night staff with shop vacs or even staff members to help people um, pull out um, furniture or whatever belongings were damaged by the water that got into their apartments. So that's the issue that's at hand right now. And of course, <clears throat> one of the other things that, that's occurring, and I'm not really going, I'm not really blaming the manager, but the thing is, you know, there are repairs that people are complaining about that are not being done fast enough. And, um, that's something that I'm bringing to your attention right now. It's been brought to the attention of a couple of other colleagues of yours. All right, but since you're on the show right now and I'm here with my fellow presidents, you know, I, I wanna um, make that announcement. But I do thank you for, for joining us this Sunday. All right, that's the other ask. You gotta turn us into an actual show. We want prime time. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> hey, Tony, Mr. can you take a picture of that and send it to me so I can have either myself or my staff attend that meeting, if you don't mind. Yes, sir. Yes, I will. And then, Tony, before I let you go, can you just share with uh, Senator Jackson your thoughts on the blueprint? Um, <clears throat> well, what's happening, I can tell you this much. With the residents, you know, everybody's still learning more and more about the blueprint. Um, a lot of people, they're in fear of it because it's still a big unknown. There's uncertainty as to 
how it's going to, if this development, it should be taken over by the blueprint if it's passed, how it will really affect each individual resident here. Um, from the discussions on, on this show, on this topic, um, there are things to, to, to consider in terms of when they talk about uh, restructuring the apartments, fixing the apartments, how people may have to move out of their apartments in order for the apartments to be, uh, be repaired. But then there's a concern, once that the work is done, will that same family, will they be able to move back into the apartment or would there, would there be a possibility of um, everything being resized based upon family composition? So that's a concern with a lot of the, a lot of the residents here in this development. Um, and again, even though it's been promised or stated that your rent is still based upon 30% of your income, there's always that, that concern that if there's a private entity involved, that something may happen on happen down the line where as far as that 30% threshold may end up changing because of certain demands, certain costs that may be incurred, and all that may be for may actually be forced its way onto the residents themselves. Like if this was this became a private building as opposed to being considered public housing. Okay. Uh, sure. Hey, 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 Marquis, I'm, I'm looking at the chat and yeah. <laughs> here Maria says, remove your name now. If not, we will primary you. That's good, Maria. That's democracy in action. If somebody wants to primary me, they can do that. I mean, that's democracy. And so, and I don't, and I don't move by threats either. I mean, I'm not going to remove my name now. And as I said, I will look at it. And I will let Marquise and the and the residents know whether or not I will remove my name or I won't. But so, but uh, you can express yourselves, and so uh, you don't intimidate me at all. I, I, no one does, not even the governor and and anybody, no one else. I am who I am. I've been a fighter in the streets for years, and I'm not going anywhere. So that's why I wanted to come in. And when I first said to Marquise in front of uh, at Dykeman houses uh, that. I'm not gonna do anything that's gonna go against the majority of the residents, leaders of NYCHA housing and that we'll talk about. It. And that's why he invited me to come in. I said, I'll come in and listen and, uh, and speak. And that's why I'm reading materials that I have that has been given to me by my staff so I can be up to speed uh, with anything and everything that's going on. So I appreciate though everyone's right to speak up and to uh, run for the democratic primary. I just think that uh, it's, it's called democracy. Yes, and, and we, of course, are reiterate, right? We are thankful for you to come. It is your job to listen to the people and, and, and follow the direction of the people, but you're not mandated to be here on a Sunday. And so we appreciate it, um, the fact that you are here on a Sunday. And, and, and I do wholeheartedly, right, respect the fact that you made your stance very clear and that you didn't close the conversation and that you are here to talk about it. Um, and at the very least, that's what we expect from our elected officials to be able to have conversations mm -hmm. and, and find middle ground where we all can agree. I have two more. Um, if you are trying to get on stack, uh, we'll find a, find a way to let me know. I'm gonna ask people to go off mute in a second uh, once we get to the last two folks um, on the stack. But I have Ms. Dana followed by Ms. Beverly. Okay. Ms. Ms. Dana, we're having a hard time. Yeah. Um, I just wanted to, to bring one thing to your attention, um, and that is that most residents have no idea what this blueprint will represent for them. And, and I'm going to be honest with you, many who have come before us on Sundays have no, have no conception of what the blueprint really means and the changes that will come about to the livelihood of many of us, who especially our seniors and disabled, like myself. Um, and NYCHA has stepped away from its responsibilities all along. Um, 
in my development from March 17, 2020, we have been running a COVID-19 program here to supplement what is needed for our community. Um, it, we supply PPEs, we supply food, uh, we do many things. But I also wanted to say to you that at the end of the day, I don't believe that most people understand the psychological badgering that is taking place to the residents of NYCHA with this blueprint. I don't believe that most understand the cataclysmic changes that could happen to many residents who live under Section 9 now but will be forced to be Section 8. And I, I just think that, that if anything, uh, to understand this bill, you have to hear the people as well. So when people are, let's say a bit forceful or sound a bit threatening, it's a psychological thing that we're all going through. So please be patient and understand that our residents and our resident leaders are fighting for their homes. This is our sanctuary. And some of us like myself, I'm in a wheelchair and I'm also a cancer patient. And I run my St. Mary's resident council like a chief every day. And I fight for it every day. So understand that you know we're not threatening you by no means, but we are asking you to look at our position and understand that we are in a, a place of uncertainty. We are in a place of being ignored by so many and a place of misunderstanding for many of those, of those that represent us. Many that have come before us in the year and a half we've been doing this have not even read the blueprint. They don't have any conception of what it really means. So I'm just asking you to take the time when you read that blueprint in its entirety to understand our position as well. And, and, and of course, like Ms. McFarland said, we weren't even invited to the table at its conception which is a violation of 96400 regulations. So we, we do this for a reason. And the reason is our homes, our sanctity, our safety, our psychological welfare as well, and spiritual as, as well. So please have an open mind that this is not a badgering of sense of sorts. I'm not worried. Yeah, Dana, I'm here. I hear I do have an open mind and Listen, uh, this is this is leaders that have been dealing with this for years, and 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 it, they're tired of saying, uh, hearing yes, 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 and, and not getting anything done <laughs> from elected public officials or what people call politicians. I don't consider myself as a politician. I tell people right away, say you're a politician. I say, oh no, I'm not politician. I'm an elected public official, and so. That's who I am. Uh, I know who I am and I know what I'm about and I know the type of work that I do on behalf of the people that I represent. So, and I hear you loud and clear and, and I, can, I can respect all of you. And, and Beverly, I, I apologize for ask, saying, what are you drinking? You know, uh, that, that was just a figure of speech and I, I apologize for that, but it's all good. And I'm gonna be coming in in future meetings to, I wanna hear, is this just a gripe session or we're focusing on what the game plan is? Because I, want, I need to know what the game plan is uh, as far as the details of it to try to help move in that direction from, and educating my colleagues. I agree. Especially when we're at the table uh, discussing it as members of the housing. I'm on a, I'm on a housing committee uh, at, at, in the state Senate and I made a list also of, I wanna know who is the current chair of the city council housing committee and its members in both the assembly and the Senate and the city of New York. And in the state Senate, I chair the city's committee uh, that deals with New York city issues. And obviously NYCHA is a big issue of New York city. 
We want to be, uh, Miss, Mr. Bowman is echoing everything you're <laughs> saying. Um, but in addition, I know that you have a strong um, and diligent staff, but we also want to be your support and we want to be a resource to you. It's, it's within um, our interest that you are able to come to us and learn about what's going on, hear about the residents' experience, and of course, uh, hear and push what it is that the residents want um, as solutions. Um, uh, first and foremost, we definitely want some consistent and adequate state funding. We do want to preserve all of those rights and protections that come under Section 9. We don't want to put our homes in further risk of foreclosure. And more importantly, um, we want to make sure that residents have a full say, whether that means a vote, whether that means going through the uh, tenant association presidents, there must be a real concerted effort, effort not to simply engage residents, but to make sure that residents are part of the decision-making process. Ms. Beverly? Yes. Um, my last say, oh, it wasn't me, um, Senator Jackson, that you were speaking to in reference to drinking. Oh. <laughs> it wasn't me. I don't, I don't know who it was. But okay. um, I want you to, while you're reading um, information, um, it's very important to read tenant protection vouchers. Mm -hmm. Tenant protection vouchers is only supposed to be issued to resident, um, um, people who's losing their homes and for a demolishment and transformation. So these tenant protection vouchers are, it, um, Gregory West are asking um, it in, you know, that for, uh, for these tenant protection vouchers I think is like he's telling the federal government that we need these tenant protection vouchers. And what is his reasoning for asking for tenant protection vouchers when, if he's not going to demolish our property or he's not going to transformation in terms of transferring of some of us residents from our homes? So why is it you being used in, in, this, in, this, in this kind of, um, you know, platform? They're not supposed to be used unless it's for demolishment. These are res these are people. Um, tenant protection vouchers is only issued if you are your property is being demolished. Okay. I'm going. Uh, so you I'm, can read up on the tenant protection voucher and see why is uh, he asking for tenant protection vouchers. So Aaron Rose, I'm going to have a stack of reading material while I'm on a plane traveling to Tanzania in, a, in about a week, but I, I'm. I will read that, Beverly. Uh, uh, and so, Aaron Rose, let's look up the, the tenant protection vouchers. What is the vouchers for and for whom, you know, as far as you know, is it for people that are on the verge of being evicted or whatever? I'll, I'll read it. Thank you. Yes. And also, I did put in the chat the 964, I believe it's 135, that it says that um, tenant leaders should be um, a part of. The, um, upon conception you know, of all facets. Okay, got it, thank you. Thank you. All right, doing a time check here. Um, it's uh, 4.44, I have four people with their hands up. I'm gonna close it there um, and try to get through all four people. So please be, remind, uh, be mindful that there's someone who wants to speak. Um, and get a response after you. So try to keep it to the point and short. Uh, so with that, I'm now passing it to Mr. Joshua Burnett. Please say who you are, full title. Hi, I'm very mindful of the time. Hi, Senator Jackson, thanks for coming. My name is Josh Barnett. I'm not a NYCHA um, resident, I'm a NYCHA employee. Um, I've been in NYCHA since 1999. Um, and like the residents here, maybe for slightly different reasons, I'm also terrified of RAD and the blueprint because they do represent the privatization of public housing. And they also have a strong union busting component to these things. I mean, since I've been in NYCHA, we've lost 25% of the staff, especially the maintenance staff. And that's had a tremendous impact on the deterioration of the buildings. I mean, that's Basically what happened to public housing in Chicago, they just let it deteriorate to the point where people couldn't live there, you know, and so without the people to maintain it, including resident hiring, 
you know, it's really only going to get worse. Um, and there's a huge amount of outsourcing and privatization, like Joel was saying at NYCHA, that, you know, nobody's, I don't, they keep like two sets of books. You know, no one's really minding the store. And even though it's more expensive, they spend that kind of money. And the funding is the main problem. But it's also that, you know, we, we need to keep public housing public. We need to make sure that the people are hired, are hired as union workers, as civil service workers, as residents. Because um, otherwise, if it just goes to the consultants like Joel and other people have been saying, that just means that, we, that people just living living with a landlord and working for a landlord. And we know that doesn't work. So we just want to make sure that, you know, that public housing stays funding. Privatization is a poison pill. And once we swallow it, there's no going back. And I'm saying that from the workers and from the residents' point of view. So thanks, Evan, for coming. But we really have to put a stop to both Red Pact and the Blueprint for everybody's sake. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, next, I am going to Aitza, and then we'll close with Mr. Bowman. Um, anyway, I just want to thank everybody for coming on the call and Senator. Two points that I want to make to you. The okay. original 62 that were done under the voucher system was Shola's um, Atali's idea to save because the, the apartments or the homes that these people, residents were living in were unbearable. And she found the money to rehab their apartments. So Beverly, you're absolutely correct. Who and is it was she again? Who is she? Our former chair before this chair that we had. So, uh, Shola. 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 Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. She okay. knew exactly. And, and, and I can talk about this because she and I had a long conversation about it. So, that's why she only asked for 62,000 because those were the ones that needed to be fixed and the private sector dumped it on NYCHA. And so that was her way of correcting the error. The other point I just wanna tell you is for everybody on this call, we need not to sleep on and take for granted that the democratic candidate's gonna win because that's what happened with Trump and I can't take another four years of another Trumpy. <laughs> OK, so, no, I'm serious. And I think we need to take seriously, um, you know, making sure that our residents go out to vote in November and not take anything for granted. I'm not willing to take anything for granted. We need to maintain our 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 majority in, in the House and in the Senate. Mm. And I and I think. You, you know, and so it's not, and I, and anyway, I, I don't care because I can't drink. I'm allergic to alcohol, but I just wanted to thank you for showing us respect and at least listening to us, which is something that has not really been done. And so I thank you for that. Oh, you're welcome. I mean, I mean, I, I just said, I'm, I'm in it for the long haul as far as, uh, so when I'm uh, in hearings on housing, or, or if there's a hearings in, in New York City, besides you as uh, a NYCHA leader is going to give testimony at the hearings, uh, I, I would go also myself. Because that's what it's about. It's about representation. Thank you. And forgive me if I didn't get to you, if you want to speak, if you are really burning and I miss you, I think we can make time for you. Uh, otherwise, the last speaker is Mr. Reginald Bowman. Uh, thank you, Marquise. Again, I think it's very important, and I put it in the chat, that we need to make sure that we have a campaign and a strategic plan to put together our positions and our plan of action as resident leaders going forward without having a specific, detailed, strategic, prepared plan of action um, to parrot what my colleague, Senator Jackson said, it'll be, we'll just be complaining, but not setting a road or a direction for policymakers and people to take. So I think it's very important uh, as we go forward. And I really appreciate the fact that Senator Jackson has taken the lead on making sure that he publicly acknowledges us and 
uh, promises and, and has demonstrated that he will listen and include us in on the policy making. I think it's important for us as, as a group <clears throat> to take these steps also, so that when people ask, well, what is it since you're against this, what are you for and what's your plan of action? We have a strategic uh, detailed and organized written documented plan of action going forward. The final thing, um, I want to make an announcement uh, to some folk. Uh, as the senior member of the Citywide Council of Presidents and the person that they recently appointed to be responsible for government and um, public engagement, um, we, we sent out an email over the weekend. Hold on, there's some noise in the background. We sent out an email over the weekend um, with a um, letter that the New York City Housing, that CCOP and the New York City Housing Authority uh, combined uh, forces on to urge the federal government and the Congress and the Senate to fully fund public housing. So you should have a copy of that in your email. And if you don't, uh, please get in contact with me and I'll make sure that you get it. Um, also, during the week, this week coming up, there will be a citywide meeting of um, CCOP, NYCHA, and the resident leadership. Um, please look for that Zoom or um, uh, Teams notice in your email, uh, because uh, one of the things that's important as we go forward um, as a group in residents and, and residents to preserve and all of us around the city is we won't get anything done unless we raise our voices the way we used to raise our voices years ago. Some of you on the call remember that when we used to raise our voices and go to Washington, we always got what we wanted. Um, we can raise our voices a lot behind closed doors and what have you, but we have to raise our voices during this time uh, with the Senate and the House so we can make sure that Washington DC um, listens to what we need in terms of public housing funding and, and management and capital and infrastructure going forward. So look for the emails from uh, the Citywide Council of Presidents regarding uh, the demand for Washington and for the meeting that we're going to have during the week. And hopefully we'll be able to continue to work with uh, people like Senator Jackson and others who are going to be our allies and partners going forward to get our homes fully funded and fully protected. Hey, but you that, know, I yield the floor. Can you send uh, Aaron Rose, who my policy director, who put her email and phone number in the chat? Can can you send her that letter that uh, that you said you were sent to Washington? Is that okay? Okay. All right. Thank you. In fact, in fact, most of most of the presidents who are on this call should already have it. Um, um, let me look in the chat right now because I'm um, I'm making sure that I. Okay. Did did she put her information in the chat? She did, yes, she did. Uh, it's uh, it's in the chat. I think is. Well, I'm going to put my email in the chat. Aaron Rose. And she can she she can get to me, and I'll make sure she gets the documentation. Yeah, I think she just put it in again, uh, right oh, there. Oh, I see it, now. Aaron Rose. I, okay, I see it. Thank you. Yeah, anyone, please feel free to say that again. Email us if you have materials that you want us to review. I beg you, I love to read it. I love to share it with the Senator as well. So if you have anything, don't be a strange. Okay, Senator Jackson, thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Um, you see the group of people 
uh, who give me my marching orders, these are my <laughs> bosses. And so I say that because they are going to tell me to keep pushing, to keep pushing until we get your name off of this legislation. Okay. With all seriousness, <laughs> with all seriousness I, I really do it. And I think you've heard from all of the folks on this call that we really do respect the fact that you took the time on a Sunday to come and talk about this really important issue. Um, and that there are, they, we have to put together um, a full comprehensive plan and, and believe you me, I'll be sending you um, lots of information as we wanna continue to be a resource. And of course, um, this is home. So anytime you have a, a couple of hours on Sunday from three to five, <laughs> jump on, it's always the same Zoom. You might get tickled by what Mr. Curtis has to say next week, so feel free to join. <laughs> um, and and in closing, we have we in a nutshell, what we want is we want to preserve the 964 rules and regulations that govern public housing under Section Nine of the Housing Act of 1937. No other resident in the city has that type of protection and that type of level of making sure that residents have the ability to be fully engaged. We wanna make sure that our homes don't fall prey to the private market and allowing the housing authority or allowing the public housing preservation trust to borrow without protection against foreclosure is just simply irresponsible. And, and we have to make sure that that doesn't happen under our watch. We also have to make sure um, that there is continued funding. As I mentioned earlier, the Blueprint for Change proposal is a 10-year plan. We won't see 40 billion from that plan. It is a plan that, is, that relies heavily on government funding. And so like with any other government funding entity, there is always a risk that the government will fund it adequately. And because of that the risk, we don't want to take the chance that our homes will go into a foreclosure because government won't provide the necessary funding. Finally, throughout this pandemic, I have seen more than any time of, and I have been a community organizer for 15 years, I have seen tenant associations step up where the, where the, the New York City Housing Authority has failed. Residents have made sure that whatever the, Resident leaders have made sure that whatever the resident needs, whether it was food, PPE equipment, uh, making sure that they were able to get tested, making sure that they were able to get vaccinated. It was the resident leaders that stood up and led all of these efforts. As Ms. Aisha said in the beginning, residents have the full capabilities, and as you witnessed on this call, to manage their own developments. The next time we have a conversation, I'd love to jump into Resident Management Corporation, right? Resident Management Corporation in a nutshell is about residents being able to fully take over their development, but it also means that they can do it incrementally, right? Maybe they start off with just doing maintenance, or maybe they start off with doing pest control. They can take on different aspects of not just operation until they're fully able to take on full management of their NYCHA development. They simply need more funding and resources and support to make that happen. They certainly have the drive, the will to do it. And it's within their interest to make sure that we preserve public housing. So with that, I wanna give you the floor to say your final thoughts before we close out. Okay, well, first, I thank you for allowing me to come in and, uh, and to listen to what everyone had to say. And, uh, and it's helping me to focus on uh, NYCHA, um, uh, Tony Edwards is, is uh, the, the president of Marble Hill Houses and that's in, in my district. I don't I haven't any anyone else that came in. I don't recognize anything. So uh, I, I do know that uh, Andrew Stewart Cousins who is the majority leader of the state Senate. Uh, I'm told that uh, she grew up in NYCHA development and I heard from the city council member, yep, Helen, yep. Helen Rosenthal, that she grew up in Amsterdam houses. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna be talking to her about uh, the leadership team here uh, and sharing anything that you want me to try to share with her. 
uh, to do that. And as I said, I will be reading up, uh, asking a lot of questions and coming back. Sorry, sorry, that you're on mute. Yeah, did you hear what I said? As far as I will be coming back uh, and trying to listen and to do what I can to be helpful in moving the agenda along. Thank you. I'm not sure if he wants to speak, so I'm only calling it out because he went on mute. But Mr. Danny Barber, the okay, he's typing it. All right, I'm guessing he didn't want to. He went on off mute by accident. But Danny Barber, the Citywide Council of Presidents Chair, is here with us today. Just wanted to make sure I acknowledge him. We also had um, representation from our very own uh, Assemblywoman Chantel Jackson. And our also um, dope staff and member of our coalition, we have Mercedes Jennings, who's representing Senator Mike Gennaris. So thank you all so much for a beautiful Sunday and a very informative conversation. I look forward to our continued conversations. Until next Sunday, folks. Thank you, everyone. Senator Jackson, speak to Cordell Claire, please. Yeah, Cordell, I saw her the other day.